Good morning from the city of Gao, here in the southern part of Sri Lanka. Today I will first explore the surrounding beaches, and then come back later in the afternoon and tour the famous Gal Fort. Starting first with the beaches is a no-brainer, as it is the right weather now, and currently way too hot to wander around the fort. And as you can see, I start right away by driving into the small village of Unawatuna, as the beach is situated only about 5 kilometers to the east of the city of Gal, so literally, it is just a very short drive around the corner. And while I am now passing the Unawatuna village shops, restaurants and hotels to my left and to my right, let me get a bit into the interesting history of this small village and its famous beach. According to historical records, Anawatuna traces its roots to the great epic Ramayana, where the monkey warrior Hanuman was sent back to India to fetch the four medicinal herbs from the Himalayas. In order to heal Lakshman who was wounded trying to save the abducted princess Sita from the demon king Ravana. Hanuman failed to identify these herbs, so he lifted the entire mountain and carried it to the battlefield to try to save Lakshman, but in the process, a chunk of it fell down in the location of the present-day Anawatuna, and so the name of the village was born, deriving from the word Dunawatuna, which means, fell down. These rocks can clearly be seen on the west side of the Rumasala hill here at the Anawatuna beach. Later on came the Portuguese and the Dutch, and it is said that after defeating the Portuguese at the fort of Nagambo, the Dutch sailed south and landed here in Unawatuna in 1640 and then marched into Gal City, and had a fierce fight, at the Magal Peninsula, with the Portuguese. Sadly, heavy losses have been recorded on both sides, with over 400 soldiers being killed on the Dutch side, while on the Portuguese side, a mere 49 soldiers could manage to get back to their fortification in Gal, where they were held in siege for four days, before they finally surrendered to the Dutch. The Dutch then built houses here in Unawatuna for their officials, such as the Nutka Dact Hotel, the Unawatuna Hospital and the Mansion Maharambi, which are all Dutch edifices. And here we come back to the present day. This very place, in the late 70s and 80s was somehow the secret Blue Lagoon, due to its unbelievable pristine beauty and unspoiled surroundings. Well, it lost quite a bit of that charm as I can see. First of all, while I am driving along through the Unawatuna village, I am noticing that it is clearly not as deserted as before. Then it looks like that they have an oversupply of tuk-tuks which is creating a gridlock on the village road here. And I have been told that it can take up to an hour to travel a few hundred meters during this in-house created village rush hour traffic.
Anawatuna as of today, has really developed into a major tourist attraction, mostly because of its still golden sand and its clear turquoise water. That is surrounded by green palm trees and giving me a feeling of being in a jungle-like bay. And at the west end of the beach, there are the large rocks that Hanuman lost, as well as the Weli Devalaya temple and some stairs that lead up to the Hanuman temple and a small pagoda. From there you can walk further until you reach the jungle beach road, which leads to the Japanese Peace Pagoda, located here on the Rumasala Hill. Rewarding you with an amazing view overlooking the Unawatuna Beach and the Bay of Gal including its fort and the city of Gal. Unfortunately, Unawatuna is now more packed than ever and not much is left of that blue lagoon feeling of the yesteryears. Also the newly opened 16-story 5-star property is somehow an eyesore, and it verifies it even more that the days of Anawatuna as a paradise are gone. Another bummer was due to the devastation caused by the tsunami in 2004, followed by the largely uncontrolled rebuilding that was hastily done without much oversight for the natural beauty. One more unfortunate reason for the destruction of the Anawatuna beach seems to come from its breakwater, that was built by the former government, and stretches nearly a kilometer into the ocean. As it is disturbing the natural balance of the ecosystem, and washing away the sand from one half of the beach, and depositing it on the other half. Still the beach is well sheltered by a sweep of palm-fringed hills that is enclosed by the natural double reef breaks, making it an ideal place for safe swimming, snorkeling, scuba diving and a bit of surfing. I also learned that this reef once sheltered more fish species than the Great Barrier Reef, but that is unfortunately not anymore, and the Unawatuna Beach, which was once named one of the world's best beach, is unfortunately fast disappearing today, as the once flawless crescent of sand that swept along a palm-lined shore with turquoise waters, is now more and more blanketed with ugly-looking jagged rocks. Moreover, the once so famous surfer and local culture of the Unawatuna Beach has been mainly replaced by a reckless and uncontrolled mass tourism Eldorado. Also feasting on this dilemma are the many restaurants that are trying to outdo each other with degrading their food qualities and significantly increasing their prices. In order to make as much profit from the tourism hordes as possible, and putting this once great beach into the category of paradise at risk, at least for me. Let's 
Mesa Beach. That's like a one hour drive from Gold City. So let's now go and see if the Mirisa Beach, renowned for its nightlife, whale and dolphin watching, is doing any better? It is said that the stunning Mirisa Beach is also a popular site for water sports, such as swimming, surfing and snorkeling. And here we are, and as I can see here, the bonus point here is that the beach is mostly sandy and rock-free, with resorts and their guest houses set back from the shoreline. It seems also a good place to learn to surf, as you can find here many places that rent surfboards and other stuff, as well as schools, that can teach you the very art of surfing. There is also no lack of good restaurants and trendy beach bars, and some say there is even a secret beach nearby, of which I have seen pictures but unfortunately, and due to my lack of time, I couldn't find it. The ocean here can be wild with big waves as there is no protecting reef like at the Unawatuna beach, so make sure and be safe when going out for a swim. And as we clearly can see here, Marissa comes with its own signature rock, which is called the Parrot Rock. This rock is strictly for the adventurous traveler and should not be climbed by any unsupervised children. It is set across the tranquil blue waters and the golden sandy Mirisa beach, the Parrot Rock offers one of the most scenic viewpoints. And as promised, I am now on my way back to Gal for the highlight of today, my long planned visit to the famous Gal Fort, a world heritage site not to be missed. As it is the largest still remaining and best preserved fortress here in Asia, built by the European occupiers, during the sometimes rather dark, and very mean medieval times. However, Gal has a very complex past history, and its earliest historical existence is traced back to the Ptolemy's world map of 125 to 150 Anno Domini. When it was a busy seaport, trading with the Greece, the Arab, the Chinese and many other countries. The Bay of Gal is also the harbor where the Portuguese under the leadership of Lorenzo de Almeida, made their first landing in the year of 1505 that caused a notable change in the developments on the entire island and its people. Their close friendship from the year of 1484 until the year of 1514, with King Dharma Parakramabahu, resulted in the permission to build a camp to affirm the safety of the coastal areas of Sri Lanka.
This was the actual beginning of this fort's history, which was built by the Portuguese in 1541, along with a Franciscan chapel, that is unfortunately now mostly in ruins, here inside the fort. Anyway this fort is one of the most interesting examples of the Portuguese and the Dutch architecture, that has withstood the ravages of time, and even the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004, which devastated many parts of Sri Lanka, but not the fort itself, and all of this makes it already an unmissable and must-see part of my Sri Lankan trip. And so the modern medieval coastal city of Gal, was actually founded by the Portuguese colonists in the 16th century, before it fell into the Dutch hands in the year of 1640. The fort was then extensively fortified by the Dutch and the port was well developed into a key trading location before subsequently being taken over by the British in the year of 1796. During the 17th century and onwards, it changed hands so many times, making it one of the most fascinating melting pots of architectural styles and cultural influences, in all of Asia. Then here is the Dutch Reformed Church, with its imposing facade and serene interior, standing as a testament to Gal's colonial past. Just nearby, is the old Dutch hospital that has now been transformed into a vibrant precinct filled with boutiques and restaurants, offering a glimpse into Gal's evolving identity. Now there is no doubt, that at the heart of Gal, is this very iconic Dutch fort, built by the Portuguese in the 16th century during their conquests. And later in the 17th century conquered and fortified by the Dutch, until it fell again, and this time into the hands of the British. In the past, and for over 200 years, 
Gao was used as a trading port for spices and other goods. However, as of today, the fort has transformed the city of Gao into a place of history and beauty, and an architectural heritage monument, which even after more than 432 plus years maintains a polished appearance, and all this due to extensive reconstruction work done by the Archaeological Department of Sri Lanka. And as I am driving now through the fort's labyrinthine alleys, I clearly see the remnants of the colonial architecture that now changed into cute little boutique shops, art galleries, and lovely cafes. It is also very interesting to know that the fort has two gates that can be used to enter. The main gate is the one in the front, by the Gal International Cricket Stadium, and is known as the British Gate. But here on the left of the northern wall, is the old gate, and this is the only part of the Portuguese fortifications that remain after the renovations by the Dutch and the British. And is therefore called the Portuguese Gate. The old gate is integrated with a two-story warehouse building that is now the National Maritime Museum. It features a British coat of arms carved into the top of the gate on its outer face, while the gate facing the inside of the fort depicts an inscription flanked by the carvings of two lions, and a rooster between them. The inscripted date is 1669 with the add-on of the Dutch East India Company initials, and sporting the letters VOC, standing for Verenigde Ostindisch Company. This company was granted a near monopoly by the States General of the Netherlands in 1602, to carry out trade activities in Asia. I also learned that beyond its well-walked paths, the fort has many hidden secrets that add depth to its historical narrative. One of them is the Moon Bastion, a secluded corner of the fort known for its enchanting views and tranquil ambience. Another one are the underground tunnels, rumored to have served as secret passages and storage chambers during times of conflict. Anyway, seeing and experiencing the fort is proof that this is not merely a historical monument, but indeed a living testament to Sri Lanka's enduring spirit. And by my delving into the secrets of the past and exploring the amazing Gal Fort, I really tapped here into a cookie jar full of new experiences, helping me understanding the historical happenings a bit better and being now able to leave the city with an indelible mark on my Sri Lanka adventure, which will stay in my memory forever.
And here in the background is the Unawatuna Peace Pagoda, located on the Rumasala Hill that is overlooking the Bay of Gal and the Unawatuna Beach right behind the east side of the hill. It is one of three Buddhist stupas in Sri Lanka built with the help of Japanese monks. And with this magnificent sunset over the Fort of Gal, I will end my video here and now. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope that you also enjoyed exploring the beaches and the Fort of Gal, as much as I did. Also thanks a lot for a big like, and for subscribing to my channel. For now I wish you a good night, and see you in my next episode, where I will be driving from the city of Gal to the capital city of Colombo, traversing the beautiful western coast here on the island of Sri Lanka.